Welcome. On behalf of Delta Computer Systems, thank you for joining us. We hope that this morning's webinar will provide you with some great information. Just a quick housekeeping reminder, this session is being recorded and will be available shortly after the conclusion of the, today's presentation. Today's presenter is Jacob Passo, Motion Products Development Manager here at Delta Computer Systems. Jacob is also heavily involved with technical support and training here at Delta. Quick word of reminder, if you have questions, please feel free to enter them via the chat box in the what your webinar controls on your screen. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to Jacob. Thank you, AJ. Welcome everyone to today's webinar, Controlling Overlap Spools and Nonlinear Valves. Again, like AJ said, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat window and I will try to answer them as we go. We also have some panelists on board who will provide answers. Today, we will cover overlap spool valves using the output deadband and deadband tolerance compensation parameters and how to tune for overlap spool valves. We will also talk about nonlinear valves and how to deal with valve linearization for knee valves and for curvilinear valves, a new feature that we're coming out with soon. We'll go through information quite quickly. We'll assume some previous knowledge. If you feel you need to study up on more, you can go to our website, deltamotion.com, the education page. And on the education page, you'll find some video tutorials and a training session sequence of videos and also webinars. The recorded webinars are listed here and future ones as well. So to begin with, let's look at a zero lap spool. A zero lap spool is what we typically deal with. It's the nicest thing to deal with. It's what we suggest you deal with. If you don't like headaches, then you work with a zero lap spool. If you like headaches, you work with an overlapped or nonlinear spool. And there's a few cases where you might actually want to do that for real besides headaches. But if we look at a, a basic spool here, we have pressure coming in and tank going out. And this spool here, as it moves, it will direct oil to both sides of the piston to go in and out and move it back and forth. Now notice that we have on the spool this land here. It's very tightly cut, so it's just right on the hairy edge. And this is called a few different things. It might be called axis cut or zero lapped or critical cut spool. And we see right there that if we start moving this, immediately the pressure flows from the pressure to A here into the cylinder out. And at the same time, oil flows from B out to tank at the same time. So as soon as it starts moving, there's oil going. And in fact, even when it's stopped, usually this cut means there's a little bit of leakage going on. And so a zero lap spool will always have a little bit more leakage than overlap spools typically. So if we look at that again, as soon as the spool starts moving, we get flow on the cylinder. And we can imagine if the spool moved the other direction, the same thing would happen, just the inverse. So that's a zero lap spool. That's a nice spool, easy to deal with. Let's look at an overlap spool. Now we see here in the middle, the spool, these lands, they actually overlap. So we have to move this away before we get any flow from P to A or from B to T. So if we look at that spool moving we'll, on that overlap, it moves a little bit. And so we move that spool already and we're getting no flow whatsoever. And we can move that spool back and get no flow and move the middle and get no flow. So we basically have to move it a certain distance before we get any flow at all. This is the basic characteristic of an overlap spool valve. Of course, if we moved it further than that, we would eventually get flow. It's just that the animation here doesn't show that. So let's look a little bit more at what happens with the control signal. The control signal that the controller sends to the valve electronics turns into a spool position. So this signal percentage ends up telling the spool what position to go to. Now, if we look at that spool in a valve and on a cylinder, the spool position, it results in a proportional velocity. 
So the control signal is proportional to the spool position, which is proportional to the velocity. And if we look at maybe a little table of motion, for example, we see that if we give 10% signal, say on this particular system, we have to get 30 millimeters per second velocity. Doing twice as much, we'll give twice as much and three times as much, three times as much. So it's very much linear and proportional. And this is assuming a basic zero lap linear, nice behaving valve. So it helps understand the relationship between the control signal, spool position, and velocity. And mostly we can just forget about spool position, just look control signal and velocity. So if we then look at an open loop control signal that we're sending to a zero lapped valve, and let's say we start at zero and we ramp it up to 100% over some time, the actual velocity should follow that proportionally. And we should see that the actual velocity responds fairly quickly here on a zero lap valve. But now if we consider an overlap valve, the same control signal, and we look at the actual velocity, we notice here that the actual velocity doesn't move until the control signal is as large as the overlap. So the control signal started going up here, and we can picture in our heads how that spool started moving, but it, there wasn't any flow yet until the control signal was large enough, meaning the spool moved far enough, and now all of a sudden we get flow and velocity, and the axis starts moving. So we have to make sure there's enough control output before we see any motion. Now, if we look at a plot of closed loop motion, looking what that looks like, down here we have the target position, this aqua line going up, and the actual position you know, accelerates up here in constant velocity and decelerates. Then we have our target velocity here, the purple line. And notice the actual velocity kind of lags behind because the control output here it has to become a certain value before there's any flow and we get any velocity. So we can see that right here is a critical area on an overlap spool valve. And we can see that the difference between zero, notice we have the green line, that's what the scale is here for is the control output. Zero to some value, that corresponds to the overlap in the valve that we have to move it before we get any flow and we get any velocity. So the question is how to compensate for an overlapped valve? And the answer is fairly simple. What we do is always add or subtract the overlap amount. So on the control signal, if we were gonna do a control signal like this, zero to you know, some value, what we would do instead is always add the overlap amount. So it would look like this, we always just add it. And this amount that we add is the overlap compensation. And then our actual velocity will hopefully look like this, and we should see that it responds fairly quickly now because right away we added that overlap and it moved this spool very quickly to where we get flow, so then we actually get some flow and velocity here. Now, if we look at it on the other direction, a negative voltage, it looks like this. We start at zero, we go negative voltage, and we add that negative voltage right away, and it goes down, and we have you know, our actual velocity moving down and so on. So it helps to be able to understand what it looks like in the positive direction and in the negative direction. If we look at a plot of motion on what this compensation looks like, it may look like this. So if we look at the beginning here, you'll see that we automatically added from zero up to some value, this overlap compensation amount, which we call the output dead band. So it's automatically added right away. And we see also when we finish the move and we get towards zero here, where the control output may be doing tiny changes around zero, it might be positive and it might be negative. You see that we're, adding and subtracting this overlap value all the time. So it's either gonna be high here or low here, not really anything in between. And if we look at the negative direction of motion, it will look like this. We move negative on position. And so we subtract the control output immediately right here. And then when we get done with the position, you know, with the control output just being slightly above or below zero, 
it will mean it goes up or down like this. So this is classic what it will look like when we deal with compensating for an overlapped valve. And we see with this overlap that we do get a smaller delay here than if we compared to uh, the previous plot I showed you where we had a long delay where the, the actual velocity didn't start moving right away. So it really helps fix this delay. One significant problem with this is that we can get a bunch of chatter here where if the output dead band is a little bit too large, we actually keep moving up and down. Every time it goes positive or negative, we oscillate. We see this blue line is our actual velocity, and down here we see our actual position is actually oscillating. And you can hear this in the valve. It kind of goes bang, 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 bang really fast, and that's not a real good thing for the valve. It's not a really good thing for the motion. And so we can usually make the output dead band smaller so it doesn't do this, but then it might not compensate enough. So we have another parameter that we can deal with to help this called the dead band tolerance. And this is a tolerance around the final commanded position. And it does two things. One, it proportionally reduces the output dead band amplitude within the tolerance window. So that overlap, let's say it was 20%. So when we're in the tolerance window, it reduces it to less than 20%. So we're less likely to, to uh, chatter because the amplitude isn't high enough to actually cause motion. But second, it also only winds down the integrator inside the dead man tolerance. Remember the integrator it adds up the difference and gets bigger and bigger and bigger until it finally starts moving. Well, when we're holding position on an overlap spool valve, we don't really want the integrator to be winding up this way and then winding up the other way and causing bumps of motion in both ways. So in that window, the integral gain only winds down. And both of these combine to reduce oscillation within the dead band tolerance window. Let's see what it looks like on a plot. So here we have our target position going up and holding final position. In our actual position, maybe it's oscillating around like this or something. So we define a dead band tolerance, fairly small value around this final commanded position. And in that position, you know, our control output maybe looks like this when we're doing compensation with just the output dead band. But now with the tolerance, we can reduce that to become smaller so it won't actually cause a chattering. Another way to visualize this is if we just look at a chart of the position error and then the output dead band versus the position error. So the position error here means the target is right at the commanded position. So we're holding position. So what we do is we ratio the output dead band by this red line. So if we're zero position error, the output dead band will be zero. But as the position error gets bigger, the actual position comes farther away from the final commanded position, then the output dead band comes bigger and bigger. And so as it drifts away, you actually get enough voltage to maybe shoot it the other direction. And then this dotted line lists the dead band tolerance. Once we the position error is big as the dead band tolerance, then the output dead band is just its normal value. So on the plot again, if we had this actual position going up, we see that it oscillates. Notice here the actual position is ahead of the target, so we need negative control out to bring it back. And so we see the output dead band brings it all the way negative. And then when it oscillates there, it goes up the other way. And so you can see as it goes up and down, this control output kind of matches that. Well, as it's winding up and down, you know, it causes us trouble. And we can see that if we apply the dead band tolerance, it will look roughly like this instead the integral gain does not wind up and down. It basically stays very still. And there may be one or two bumps of control output, especially right when it's decelerating, when it's trying to decide which direction it's supposed to be, um, may do something like that. But for the most part, it just kind of clears out and is still. So the dead band tolerance, it can reduce small oscillations while holding position. But there's a downside. It may limit the accuracy at holding position because the integral gain isn't working all the way in that range. So if the integral gain can only wind down, it's not always trying to get us exactly to position. 
So it can limit the accuracy, but that's a whole lot better than uh, just chattering back and forth. So you kind of have to have your, you know, pick your pick which battle you want to fight. One more thing with overlapped spool valves and trying to compensate for them. It's very important. Spools cannot move infinitely fast. You see the spool moving up there. You know, it's a mass. And uh, Newton said that force is equal to mass times acceleration. And there's no such thing as infinite force or infinite acceleration. So spools cannot move infinitely fast. So what this means is if we have a control signal and, you know, we add this overlap amount or output deadband to compensate for the overlap valve, that's all fine and good. But notice there will still be a time delay because it takes a while for the spool to move to the point where it can allow flow. And this prevents quick changes in direction. There's no way to get around these laws of physics. So if we consider changing directions now on a zero lap valve, and let's say we have a sinusoidal control signal. We're changing directions here. The velocity is proportional to the control signal. And then we have the actual position. Let's draw a few lines here so we can kind of see what's happening. The actual velocity here is zero, so the actual position isn't changing. Right here, the actual velocity is high, so the actual position is changing a lot. Right here, the actual velocity is zero, so our actual position is zero. And we go from positive velocity to negative, so we're actually changing the direction of position here. So this is a zero lap valve. You know, motion looks all nice and good and you can do exactly what you want. No headaches, you know, you can get this thing set up in minutes and go on to the next job. Now let's consider an overlap spool valve. We have the same control signal and then we do the compensation. We add some voltage here and then we subtract on the negative. So we're always adding or subtracting, so we're compensating for that overlap. Well, here's the actual velocity, and we see that we have zero velocity during the closed time of the valve. So all of a sudden it closes here, and the velocity stops, but it takes a while for that spool to move to the next value. So during that time, the velocity is stopped. And the actual position looks like this. We have a nice flat spot here this just stopped for a while while it's turning around and then here it's flat and there it's flat so in changing directions and overlap spool valves it's impossible to do it as quickly as a nonlinear valve so very important to remember it's happened sometimes that someone is called up and they're doing a sine wave and they're wondering why there's flat tops and explain there's overlap spool valve and laws of physics that spools can't move infinitely fast and then they ask but how can i compensate for that and that's kind of frustrating. So sine waves can't really be done with uh, overlap spool valves. Tuning for overlap spool valves. These are the basic steps. First of all, it's important to determine and set the output dead band. So normally you have to look at your valve uh, diagrams, flow diagrams, and see what the output dead band is. Um, then you manually tune them. And the feed forward right now, the uh, auto tuning or tuning wizard doesn't work with the output dead band so well. Um, you have to make sure your proportional gain is high enough. I actually did this a few weeks ago remotely with someone. They had a system, couldn't figure it out. I went online and eventually figured out it was overlap spool and tried to tune it wasn't working. Um, but when I cranked up the P gain, all of a sudden it started working better. So we do want to make sure that proportional gain is high enough as well. And then we'll wanna set the dead band tolerance if we're getting chatter. And you notice you may need to iterate a little bit here on this. So I wanna show you a little bit of uh, the flow diagrams that you may typically see on an overlap spool valve. Uh, let's see here. So here is a valve, this is a flow diagram. Um, we have the percentage of command signal here, zero to 100. Be careful, sometimes valve manufacturers, they cut off the bottom here. They don't start with zero, they start with 10. So you take a quick glance, you think it might be linear, but then you notice it starts with 10% on the x-axis here, and that means it's overlap. But this one's zero to 100, so we see that, you know, we have several different options for this valve. You know, one was 20%, some are a little bit less. 
and then this is the flow, how much we get out of that. So this is the overlap spool valve. Um, we may have, let's see, here's, this is actually a nonlinear one we'll talk about a little bit later. And let's see, there was another one here I was going to look at, I thought. Huh, okay. Well, I guess uh, I didn't quite have that like I thought. Um, but that first one we looked at does indicate that we have the uh, overlap spool right here with no flow. So with the tuning, we are going to look at a live example of a hydraulic cylinder, two, in, or two foot stroke, 24 inches, two inch diameter. We have three different valves on this cylinder. Um, we switch them in and out with solenoid valves. So we can actually play with different types of valves today. We have a position sensor on there with nice high resolution. And let's go ahead and look at that system. So I have RMC tools open connected to it. And we have our camera here showing the system. Uh, we see the hydraulic cylinder, the rod. This is actually just a uh, rubber block that we can press into. There's a little round plate here, so we can do force control also. And over here, we see a couple of the valves. If I move the camera, we can see all three valves. So we have uh, several different types. One is overlap spool, and there's a couple of nonlinear ones that we'll be using today. So I'll switch this back so we can see the system as we're moving. I'll put that down below on the screen so we can see it as we're moving back and forth. So this axis here is uh, already set up with this position feedback and so on, but we have not tuned it. We haven't done anything with the uh, dead band compensation. Notice in the axis parameters, if we go down to the all tab, the output section is where I have the output dead band and dead band tolerance parameters that we're going to be working with. So let's go to the plot manager, the tuning tab. And we have, let's see, what do we have? We have plot axis zero. We have our gains. We'll start a trend here and we'll move this system back and forth. I have some shortcut commands set up here that I may use, um, but we'll see what happens here. The open loop rate will put in 10%. And notice that the control output here jumps up 10% and my actual position isn't changing at all. If I move it to 20%, click send, now my position is starting to move. You can see down here in the video that we're also moving. Okay, so 20% makes it move. Um, let's see what makes it stop. If I go to 15, it slows down. If I go to 12, it slows down and stop. Well, just about stop. 13, moves a little more, 14. So about 11 maybe makes it stop. So our dead band is about 11, 12. Let's try the negative direction. If I go negative 12, uh, it's still stopped. Um, negative 15, negative 15 bumps down, it starts moving barely. So mag ne negative 17 and it starts moving. So negative 15 is about where it goes. So we went from positive 12 to negative 15. So it's not entirely centered. That means the output bias can probably be negative a little bit, or let's see, you know, positive, I guess we want to do. So if we throw in a couple of percent positive bias, let's see what happens if we can equal this out. So if I do 13, it moves negative 13, negative 15. No, I did wrong direction. I need negative two, don't I? Okay, so let's do 12, stopped, 13, stopped. 14, stop, you can see it's control, control is bumping up here. Okay, so it's just starting to move at 14. If I do minus 14, it's just barely moving there. So it looks like we're pretty much centered on the output bias, and the output dead band's roughly around 14, you know, maybe 15, we actually see something significant coming. So we can probably say 15, and I'll put it back to zero and stop it here. So this is how you can tell what the output dead band is. 
Um, it helps if you have you know, a reasonable amount of stroke on the cylinder for it to move, but even a short strokes, you can do it. So in the axis tools, we can set the output dead band here to 15. Looks about right there. Um, before this, I want to show you a little bit else. Um, we'll leave that at zero. I actually have a user program here. Let's see, it's open loop test for this specific valve. I do an open loop rate command and I ramp up at a slow enough rate so I can see as the voltage changing is what, happening, what happens. And then when it gets close to the end, I do a fancy open loop absolute that ramps it down to zero over a, a range of positions. And that gives us an idea of what the system is like. So I'll move it back to zero here. Um, right at the beginning. And we'll run that user program. Let's see, open loop test D3FX, run on task zero. Okay, so this user program ramped up the control output so that we reached maximum velocity and then we slow down before we hit the end. So as we're looking here on the control output, we see that there's a delay before it starts moving. So it starts moving about there. And look at the control output here, it's 16.45. Okay, that's about where it started moving, so that's pretty close. So we're not seeing a, an extremely huge delay here um, due to the spool having to move, but a little bit. And it it kind of looks like it's not necessarily a real linear. If it was linear, it would be a straight line here. That would be really nice, but this is a less expensive valve with the less powerful solenoids, and generally they're not necessarily real linear and they have overlap spools and such. So this motion where we're ramping up while we're moving, together with what I did previously where I slowly increase the voltage, gives us a real good idea about what the dead band value is. Okay, going back to Access Tools, we'll set that to 15, download it, and now we'll start with the tuning procedure. I have a couple of motions set up here. We're moving from 20 to a position of one. Um, those are fairly slow speeds. I think I can do faster. Let's see what this, speed is here. We did uh, control output of 100% gives me a velocity of 42. So that's a pretty good velocity. Let's see, we'll probably maybe do uh, 35 in the positive direction. Should we try that? I'm fairly certain the negative direction will be less. Maybe 30 might work. And we'll see, that, see what happens here. Um, proportional gain of one, that's probably pretty slow, but let's see what happens. Sure enough, the target position goes down, the actual lag's behind, and we see down here in the camera, it's really going slow. So we can crank up that proportional gain, download it, goes a little better. Let's move to 20. Okay, looks like we're falling better. Still can crank up that gain. Move that to 20, move back to one, falling a little bit better. Notice that the control output hit 10. I'm moving too fast on the way back. So we'll change that to 25. And we'll move to 20. Uh, looks like we see the control output compensating here for the dead band. And you know, we're lagging behind a fair amount. Um, we can crank up some more. We'll do 30, move back to one. Okay, we're able to make that velocity without saturating. And notice here in the plot to the right, we see that we're having some uh, compensation going on. I think I can increase this some more. We'll go 40, move to 20. Okay, and now we see there's some compensation action over here. But now at this point, when my target and actual are parallel, I can click the adjust VFF button and get the feed forward, move in the negative direction and get the feed forward for that. And now we should have you know somewhat reasonable control. I'm moving it back and forth. And we see in the acceleration, we're lagging here and we're overshooting there. So I need some acceleration feed forward. Maybe we'll try 0 0.01 and move that. Um, okay, probably need a little bit more here. It's lagging, but here it's undershooting. So I'm not quite sure what I need. If I increase acceleration feed forward, it'll help here, but it'll make this worse. Um, Maybe I'll make it a little bit smaller. 
and see, because I probably want to focus on the end of the move, make that better. Okay, so it's still undershooting there. Maybe 0 0.04. Um, boy, that's interesting. Well, here it's actually pretty good. In this direction, it's not real good. We'll try a smaller value yet. Um, here it's overshooting now, and here it's undershooting. Well, that's kind of goofy. Um, I guess that's what I get for having a low quality valve here. Um, could also crank up the proportional gain. We'll go to 100. Like I said, it's important to have that high enough. Okay, there we're all right. Here we're getting all right. But I can hear in the valve now this compensation going on. And so that's not real good. I think we'll probably put in some dead man tolerance then. But I'll look here how well I'm holding position. Right now we're at 20.007 and 20, so we're off seven thousandths. Um, okay, well, let's go put some compensation in. Maybe five thousandths or we'll see if three thousandths or something is enough. And let's see, we'll make a move. Oh, look at that control output. Oh, it's looking a lot better there, not having to compensate. And let's see here, we're holding position 19.999 versus 20. Okay, hey, this is looking pretty good. So let's crank up that proportional gain a little bit more and move back and forth. Oh, look at that, that, that made it compensate a little bit more when I cranked up the proportional gain. Um, yeah, sure enough. So maybe I'll have to uh, increase this window maybe to five thousandths. Let's see if that helps. Okay, in this direction it's fine. Here, well, I'll compensate for a while and then settled out. Another thing I can do is probably reduce the compensation amount. I don't have, to have 15. I can go down. Let's see if I go down to 12 on the output dead band, what that does. Move to 20, move to one. Okay, so got rid of the compensation problem there. The position here is one and I'm holding it within a thousand. Um, you see that as I move this, it's just 1.001. If I move to 20 up here, if I click, looks like I'm not holding position real great here. It takes a little while to get into position. And over here, I can see that I'm off by 12 thousandths. So maybe I need a little bit more compensation, um, 14. But when I'm playing around with such fine values of compensation, I have to keep in mind that, you know, if the temperature changes or the system wears, that can change it on me a little bit. So I'm not guaranteed to have the same control as I continue working. Now in the integral gain, generally you want to set that, you know, somewhat higher than proportional gain on a well-behaved system. We'll try 5,000 or 500 and move it back and forth. Just make sure things look all right. Um, so we have some compensation here. But I think you get the idea that I can kind of chase this around all day long a little bit. I have reasonably good control. You know, for a lot of systems where you're not worried about really fine control, this could work well enough. So if you're really pressed for money on a system, you need to get that less expensive uh, uh weaker solenoid, cheaper valve, and kind of make it work, you, you can probably make it work if you have some time to fiddle with it. If you want things to work really well, nice and easy, high performance, then you get a zero lack valve. So next, I want to talk about nonlinear valves. So a linear valve generally looks like this profile here, the solid line, not the dotted line. This is a, is a typical diagram that we get from manufacturers where they have multiple valves in one diagram, but the one we want to look at is the solid line where it's zero lapped and it's basically linear. And you notice that's not entirely linear, it kind of curves a little bit, but that's fairly typical of linear valves. They're not entirely linear, especially up towards the end when you start getting to 80, 90%, they might trail off a little bit. 
And then, of course, it depends on how honest the valve manufacturers are. Sometimes take a ruler and draw a straight line, and then you hook up the valve, and you find out that straight line was just bogus. And other ones, they show a little waviness, and then we can probably believe they're actually giving a little bit more accurate picture than, than others might be giving. But this is basically a linear flow profile. If we look at other profiles, the two most common ones are the single knee, where you have this straight linear section of low gain, and then it has a knee and it goes to high gain, usually pretty linear, and then at the end it often rolls off a little bit, fairly classic. And the other one is curvilinear, where it's just totally curved. There is no sharp knee, no linear sections. It just follows a curve like this. And then if we look at lower quality valves, like the overlap spool that we were just working on with weaker solenoids, those are typically overlapped and then they kind of have a curvilinear profile. And the other thing with these is they're often not necessarily really consistent valve to valve or with varying motion. So, you know, you might tune up one and well, another one might not be exactly the same and you do motion with one, valve you do another motion with the same valve and it's just kind of not exactly the same and those valves will often come with serious operating limits so here we see that if you have the pressure drop across the valve that it lists what the flow is and then this gray area says you better not operate there because it just doesn't work because you notice if you have a more pressure flow across a valve you expect more flow that's how an orifice works but on these, if you get too much, well, the Bernoulli forces on that spool start taking effect and you get less flow. This is very non-intuitive that, hey, we're giving it more pressure, we're opening up the valve more, and we're not getting more flow. And so those are separate problems that we deal with in these valves. But this is classic for lower quality valves, that you'll have the curvilinear and the operating limits. Now, compensated for nonlinear valves, there's a very important part here. The PID and feed forwards in the algorithm are linear. So the system needs to be linear for good control. And to deal with that, we can actually linearize a control output signal so that the system then appears linear to the PID and feed forwards. Got a comment here in the uh, questions that says those lower cost valves usually have higher hysteresis values and response sensitivity values. Exactly, absolutely, that is entirely correct. So in addition to the problems I mentioned, you have higher hysteresis and response sensitivity. So to linearize a control output, what we do is we start with the flow profile of our valve. And when our control output is being calculated inside the RMC, what we do is we basically create an inverse of the flow profile and we multiply the, the control output by that inverse. So it ends up that the flow of the valve multiplied the inverse of a control output ends up resulting in what looks like a linear system to the PID and feed forwards. And when we have a linear system, life is nice and we can just keep going. So to compensate for these nonlinear valves, in the RMC, we have some parameters in the axis parameters, then the all tab in the output section. You'll see we looked at the output deadband, deadband tolerance. It's right next to it. So I have a valve linearization type. There's a none, and then there's a single point and a curve. And some of you may be wondering where this curve option is. And the answer is that it's not released yet. We've actually been testing it and expect to release it shortly. So in the valve linearization type, we have, if you have single point, what you get is two parameters called the knee command input and the knee flow output. And that corresponds to our flow valve, the command put input is the X value, the flow output is the Y value, and you just have to enter what those values happen to be. Notice this is 10 and 10, so that's actually a linear valve. You know, typically command input might be 40%, and then your flow output might be 20% or 10% or something. And then for a curve, what we do is we offer one parameter called the linearization curve ID, and there you enter the curve number that corresponds to your valve linearization. And this is a curve, um, as those of you who are familiar with curves and RMC tools, it's the exact same kind of curve. In the curve tool, you can create a curve like this. Um, we at Delta also have a few curves already pre-created and we plan on expanding that library of curves. But you will notice in the properties, you can choose the now a curve type 
whether it's a standard curve that's used for everything else or a linearization curve. If it's a linearization curve, we will require that the x axis go from minus 100 to 100 and the y goes from minus 100 to 100 and it has to be monotonically increasing so it can only be increasing it can't go the opposite direction so we will try this linearization on a valve i have my trusty assistant uh, aj here is going to switch the valve for us uh, one second aj while i make sure that we actually have zero volts on the valve Okay, go ahead and switch that. Okay, so we switch the valve to a nonlinear valve. And let's see if I can bring up the uh, flow characteristics of that one. I believe it's this uh, Bosch 4WRLE. So this one has kind of a soft knee at 20%, and we see that it goes to about 10% flow here. So this is what we call a single knee valve. So to compensate for that, we go to the axis tools and let's see, we'll turn off the dead band tolerance because this doesn't have dead band. Linearization type, single point. And let's see, we have knee command input was 20 and the flow was 10, I believe. Let's go look at that uh, and make sure that's correct here. Um, I have problems with my windows here, one second. Okay, so 20% here and 10% there. So 20 and 10. Okay, we should be good to go there. And we'll download those changes. So no output dead band, single point 20 and 10. Uh, you know what? Before I actually do that, let's look at what this looks like with open loop. So we'll change that back to zero and zero. And in the plot manager, we'll start a trend. I think that's uh, one we want. So we have a different user program for this one. Um, all the way back. Okay, so we did an open loop ramp again to check the linearity of this curve. And we see there was a delay. I don't know what that was. I wonder if I was all the way back and had negative voltage. Um, let's go ahead and move that back a little bit. I have a uh, shortcut command here. Okay, and then let's run that again. Okay, so we did still see a delay. I'm not sure what that's about. But uh, in any case, we see the control output here. It's resulting in a nonlinear velocity. So it slopes up slowly here, more there, and less there. So the knee is somewhere around here that we're seeing. And if we then go back to the axis tools, we'll put those values in 20 and 10. Oh, you know what? You guys are awake. Someone commented the output bias is negative two. You are entirely correct. Let me go fix that. Okay, we'll change that to zero, download it. Okay, let's go try to run that again. Let's see, we'll move it back, about right there. Yeah, now it's standing still a whole lot better. Okay. Okay, so we have a little bit less delay, um, thanks you to the awake person called Mike Burschbach. That's great. Okay, but we still see the same nonlinear behavior. And we'll go to the axis tools. We will go fix that 20 and 10, those are values we wanted. And now we can start tuning this system. I'll put them back to the uh, original gains, download that, and we'll see what kind of speeds we get here. What did we get on this? We got an actual velocity of 54, so pretty fast. So we're probably all right with the speed we have of 35 and the retract speed of 25. And we can probably crank that gain up above one to start with. Okay, move back here, move out. Um, I'm gonna increase acceleration and deceleration here a bit. Uh, missed that one. Just because this valve is capable of a little bit more speed. And we should be able to increase that proportional gain a fair amount. Okay, we're going up there. 
back there. And let's choose the velocity feed forward button, stick that in there, move positive, do the adjust VFF there. Now we should have velocity feed forward for both directions, looks all right. Um, throw in some acceleration feed forward. Let's see if 0 0.01 does something decent. Um, here I'm not accelerating enough and I'm decelerating more here. Um, can happen sometimes when I have the nonlinear valves. Notice one thing, if I zoom in here, we see the control output, the screen, it kind of goes up and it has a little inflection point here. That is the linearity correction working for us. It's giving us more control output than we really need to help linearize the system. We'll increase the uh, proportional gain here and keep going on the tuning, see how that does for us. Probably increase it quite a bit, 100. And it's going better and better, we'll do 150. Notice the acceleration problems I had are going away with the increased proportional gain. So the acceleration feed forward didn't fix it enough, but the increased proportional gain is. We'll throw in some integral gain. And you know, it looks like we're getting good enough control. We probably really don't need any differential gain, which is fairly common with a lot of hydraulic systems. If I put my cursor here, we see that I'm tracked within 6,000th there. As I move on, it goes down, it's off only by a thousandth. And you know, depending on my system, this may or may not be good enough. So the question here now is, did the valve linearization actually do anything? So I'm having pretty good control here already that I'm pretty happy with. If I remove the valve linearization, let's see what happens. So I'll change that to none. Download that. And let's go make a move to one and move to 20. And we see this controlling, we're getting a little bit more lag here at the beginning. At the end, we're having a little bit of misbehavior. It's overshooting um, by 60 thousandths. So apparently the valve linearization did do something. Now there's a chance I could kind of chase this with tuning, but notice the control output here. It kind of acts a little bit funny here. It's trying to find its way around and, and see what's happening. So we can see that the valve linearization actually did help something here. Now, let's go switch to a different valve. I'll put it in open loop first. And AJ, if you can switch that to valve number one. And valve number one is, uh, let's see here if I bring it on. Valve number one has this type of a profile. This one is curvilinear. So it has a, a low gain here and slowly gets becomes larger and larger. Now, if we look in the curve tool, I have such a curve for this particular valve that is curved to match it. And what we did is we just took the uh, curve from the data sheet and kind of uh, overlaid it and put points around and made it smooth. This curve is number 14. This is one we're gonna use for the linearization. And let's go to the axis, now let's skip, let's go to the plot manager and see what this uh, looks like in open loop control. So using my shortcut command, move this back a ways till we're about zero. Okay, there. And make sure my output bias is zero and everything. Okay, start a trend and we'll run the test program that I had set up for this valve. Click send. And here we see that this valve, it responds fairly quickly and it just has a nice curved profile. So it's not linear, so we do need to have compensation, but it's a fairly smooth curve. The velocity is noisy like usual. And let's see, the max velocity at 10 volts here is 30 inches per second. So we'll change this command to be 25 and the reverse direction probably needs to be less. Maybe 20 will work. Then we go to the axis tools and we choose the curve linearization. Enter in curve 14 and we'll download that. Now the plot manager, if 
if we start tuning, we'll hopefully get some control. I'll set these back to their default values. Download them. Probably throw the proportional gain to 10. And let's move to one and see what happens. Okay, we need more gain. I'll try 50 right away. And move to 20. Okay, it looks like we're getting some motion out of this. Uh, probably try the feed forward here. Just feed forward, then move to one. And we'll do the feed forward in that direction. So now we should have pretty good motion in this direction and the other direction. Um, should add some acceleration feed forward. 0 0.01 is apparently my favorite starting value. Looks like we're still overshooting here, so that's not large enough. We'll go 0 0.03. And here it looks a little better. They're a little better, but not enough. So we'll go 0 0.06. Move to one. That looks better. This looks better at the end. We're getting pretty good there. So now I can crank up the proportional gain. We'll go to 100, move to one, move to 20. Um, looks like things are working all right. The control output doesn't look so noisy, so I can probably still crank it up a bit. We'll do 150 and looks all right. Looks all right. Throw some integral gain in there, maybe 500 and make sure that looks all right. And we probably don't need any differential gain here either. Um, but look right here, we're falling within 10 thousandths, you know, not the best, but we could probably work on that a bit. And over here, we're holding position, you know, really well. So if we turn off the compensation at this point again, then we should be able to see how it's working. So we'll change that to none, download that, and we'll do a move to one and to 20. And we see that it's having a little trouble at the beginning and at the end as well. And the control output looks like it's trying to do some funky stuff to try to deal with this. So we see that the linearization did indeed help. Another thing the linearization helps is when you're doing moves at different velocities. If your valve is nonlinear, you can tune it up without compensation at a specific velocity. But if you change to a different velocity, now you have to retune it. And so the valve linearization handles all of that quite well. And that's something that we don't notice by just looking at a single velocity like we're doing now. Um, let's see if I try another velocity here. We're at 25. Let's try 15. Um, we'll just move back here shortly. I'll look at it saturated out that's not good but to 20 okay so now we had different behavior at the speed of 15 than what we did on the previous one so if we compare this one to that one of course this one took longer but the way it behaved at the end was different here it undershot and overshot here it just flat uh, undershot very slowly and overshot more whereas the valve linearization that will handle a lot of different velocities for us so if we put that back in and we make our moves, um, move to one, then to 20, um, we see that that controls reasonably well. Okay, so that's it for the demonstration on the overlapped valves and nonlinear valves. A little bit more about this. The primary reasons for using nonlinear valves that we see in our customer base is number one, ignorance. A lot of times people will buy a valve and, you know, if you have a valve that's controlled with a joystick, a manual joystick that you're pushing with your hand, having a flow profile like this is just great because when you're around zero, you move your valve just a little bit and you get great control. And then when you get larger, then you get a lot of flow. But most of the time when we're dealing with high performance valves and high performance motion controllers, we really don't need nonlinear or overlap spool valves. And this doesn't go just for nonlinear, it's overlap spool valves as well. I should have written that. Um, but usually customers just buy it, well, just because. 
And sometimes, you know, you can get an expensive valve, you can get it linear or you can get it nonlinear overlapped. And it's frustrating when there's a really good expensive valve and it is ordered as overlapped or nonlinear for no really good particular reason. Um, sometimes, however, you buy them because they're less expensive. So the lower cost valves with weaker solenoids, they are less expensive. And if you have a machine where you're looking at tight competition, you know, saving money on a valve, especially if you have many axes on there, can be a big deal. And that's where it's good to have a motion controller that has a compensation to deal with these valves and give you really good control. Um, but sometimes ignorance plus less expensive combines to make a really bad deal and the customer gets a valve that just isn't going to do what their system does. Or actually, you know, my next slide is overlap valves, I think. Um, but nonlinear valves has better control when smooth, moving slowly or stopped, sometimes. So we look at this profile here, it's a lower gain, so that's similar to having a smaller valve. And you can get finer control around position and force control as well, but you still have the high flow. So that is why you typically get a non-linear valve is to have the fine control and high flow. Now there's a big caveat, that's not always true. The behavior of valves around zero varies a lot. Just because a valve profile says it's linear, it's very difficult to know how it behaves around zero. There's differences in valves with their hysteresis, and other things that I've had a hard time quantifying around zero, but I've in practice seen it quite a bit. There is a few times that I've seen that a curvilinear or single knee valve actually does give significantly better final position or pressure holding. So it is, is one thing to try. I think the valve I actually have on here at curvilinear is one that I have seen that. But other ones, you know, they may have lower prof lower gain, around zero, but the behavior around zero is bad enough that you're not gaining anything over a linear valve. Valve manufacturers, the ones that make high quality valves are really, really good at linearizing their own valves. And that makes the setup with the motion controller a whole lot better. Now for the overlap spool of valves, when it looks like this, the same reasons for buying them apply. Number one, ignorance. Number two, less expensive. And you combine those two and it can make a really bad deal and difficult machine startup situation. But of course, there is an advantage. These valves don't move when you give 0% control output. And that's sometimes used for a safety reason that we want to do that. However, you can just use a blocking valve instead. Of course, it depends on your exact safety requirement. But again, I do want to mention that if you uh, have a system where you're looking at uh, serious competition, and you need to get your price down, well, you can go with an overlap spool valve. You've seen here that it can work very well. You can hold final position pretty good as long as you don't need to switch direction real quickly. So that's about it. In summary, linear valves are easiest and usually the best for your machine if you're looking for good performance and an easy startup situation. If you're an OEM and you're pumping out a bunch of machines, that's where it can help to really save money because you spent time up front and now that time you spent up front is uh, spread out over many machines. If you have a one-off system, well, do you want to buy a good linear valve and have a short startup or do you want to buy a less expensive valve and have a longer startup? You know, your cost may end up being the same with extra time you spend. But the RMCs can compensate for nonlinear and overlap spools. So for the valid reasons to get them, you certainly can use them and the RMCs can handle that. And the nonlinear valves can sometimes provide finer control. Before we close, are there any questions? Go ahead and enter in your chat box if you have any questions. No questions yet. Um, have uh, many of you used nonlinear valves? Are any of you looking forward to uh, the valve linearization feature we have with curves? I know some manufacturers, especially the larger valves, they don't offer a linear valve option. They only have curvilinear valve. Parker in particular, 
once you get up in their DO7, DO8 valves, I'm not sure they have a linear option. And that's been frustrating in the past, but now in the future, um, we expect to release in a few weeks of this uh, curve valve linearization option, and that should help out our customers. Okay, someone commented here, accidentally used an overlap spool on my very first project. No plans to do it again. Yep, that's uh, fairly common. Once you accidentally do it, you don't do it again. And remember, Delta Technical Support is an email or a call away. It happens sometimes that through no fault of your own, you end up being put on a machine with uh, one of these valves. And if you're stuck, give us a call and we can help you walk through it. I also want to talk about the hydraulic design guide. This talks about designing your systems and it talks about valves there as well, linear valves and overlap spools and why you may or may not want to use different types of valves. So with that, AJ, are you there? I am. Thank you so much, Jacob, for this for today's presentation. And thank you to all of our attendees. We appreciate the audience for these webinars. The, a sincere thank you from all of us here at Delta Computer Systems. You will automatically be sent a survey after attending this webinar, and we really appreciate it. If you would take a few seconds, it's only four questions long, but that's your opportunity to request future topics of interest. I mentioned at the top that we are recording this and uh, this presentation, and we'll have it up shortly. There are a couple of places to find recordings, links to recordings and schedules of the future webinars. The best place probably to go is deltamotion.com. If you navigate to the education section, there you will find a webinars page. The webinars page will have announcements on future webinars, and it also has links to past recordings. They're also being posted on forum.deltamotion.com. If you weren't aware that Delta hosts a discussion forum, uh, we invite you to check that out. Uh, there is a Delta webinars topic if you go to forum.deltamotion.com. We also have a YouTube channel. It is Delta Motion Control, all one word, and the webinar recordings are also being posted there. Thank you.